And uh, so we're going to be in chapter 1 now, and we're going to uh, go through the whole, whole text. And I think... I think that we'll be able to finish all of chapter 1 this morning. Um, Okay, so go ahead and have your Bibles open, uh, Revelation chapter 1, and we're going to, of course, begin with verse 1. We're going to go from uh, verse 1 to verse 3, okay? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bondservants the things which must take place, which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John, who testifies to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. Now we call this the book of the Revelation, or the book of Revelation. In the Catholic and in the Orthodox Church or in any of the Latin-speaking uh, Churches, uh, Spanish speaking, since Spanish is heavily Latin. This is called the Apocalypse. Um, the reason, one of the, one of the reasons why, although the Greek word is apocalyptic or apocalypsis or something like that, one of the reasons that we use the book of the Revelation is because the word apocalypse has taken on a kind of an alternate meaning in our language, the way we use the word apocalypse. If we use the word apocalypse, what does it usually, what, what, what do we describe as apocalypses? Disasters. That's usually what we refer to it. If there's a huge uh, earthquake, it's an apocalyptic earthquake. If uh, you think about the terrorist attack on 9-11, it's a, an apocalyptic attack, you know, things like that. And that really does not communicate the meaning of the Greek word here. The Greek word here means to uh, unveil or disclose. It's not unlike, and this is uh, this is uh, taken from N.T. Wright. It's not unlike the idea of an audience sitting waiting for the show to start and the curtain coming up. That idea of the curtain being drawn up and you're able then to see what's on the other side of the curtain. And that is what the word does mean. And so this is, this is the, the unveiling uh, of, of Jesus Christ. Now, you'll notice that it's of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show. So the source of the unveiling is God. And therefore, it's very much like Daniel, Zacharias, Zechariah, parts of Isaiah and Ezekiel. John is communicating that this book should stand in line with those books. And when you think about the New Testament... You think about even Matthew's use of Old Testament books. Matthew is still not an Old Testament prophetic book. It's a New Testament biographical book. The epistles, the book of Acts, they're not so much prophetic, especially in the way we often think of the word prophecy. We often think of the word prophecy to be something being foretold in the future. But remember, very important thing, one of the roles of the prophets throughout the Old Testament was not just to say what's coming down the pike, but it was also to tell the people, come back to God. It was also to call the people back to the covenant, to call the people back to faithfulness to Yahweh. Now, um, we were just talking about this. Mike, Mike and I were just talking about this. Have you ever been watching a movie or a television show and something happens very early in the show and you kind of, you kind of don't know what to do with that? But then later in the movie or later in the show, there's references back to that thing and you start to go, wait a minute, that was more important than, than I first thought. That, that, that's speaking here. Now, there's always that question. As John sat down and had the pen in hand and is writing this, 
Where does his hand end and the Holy Spirit's hand begin? Where does the Holy Spirit's hand end and John's hand begins? Now, the way Peter describes it is that men were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So my opinion is that the, the scriptures, the, the Bible knowledge that the writer had in his head, the Holy Spirit supernaturally brought that to his mind, supernaturally communicated this to him. And so as John is writing this, I don't know if we could ever precisely pinpoint where does John's hand end and where does the Holy Spirit's hand begin. Okay. But there is very interesting choice of words right here from the very get go. And there in your notes, you'll notice Daniel chapter two, verses 28 uh, through 30 and 45. John is using particular words that pop up in Daniel chapter two in the Septuagint. Oh, I should have been moving along the slides. Now, I'm not going to read the entire Daniel text. Uh, I gave that to you there for you to have, but I did highlight that in Daniel chapter 2, God reveals secrets. He's made known what will take place. And God has made known, or he has shown, or he has told, or he has revealed, or he is telling what will take place in the future. You compare Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 to Daniel chapter 2 verses 28 through 29 and 45. There is unveiling. It's from God. The things which will soon take place and it's communicated or it's signed or it's symbolized. In Daniel, there's revealed secrets. He, God, has made them known what will take place and has made known or communicated. Now, it's my thought that John's choice of words here is not accident. John's choice of words here are meant to draw the Old Testament student to sit up and take notice and go, wait a minute, I've heard that before. I've heard that before. Now, one question uh, back on Monday that um, Kathy asked me is, as we go through this and we run into these symbols, what do we know is symbol and what do we know is not symbol? And once we know something is a symbol, what does that symbol mean? Now, I, I asked her, not unlike that last question she asked in our last hour, to, to put that on hold. Now, here is a suggestion. Take it as a suggestion. As we read the book of the Revelation and we come into John using the Old Testament, we should flip back to the Old Testament. And we should remind ourselves... What was, what was Daniel? What was Isaiah? What was Ezekiel talking about? Not just that verse, but what was the context of the verse? One of the questions about literal versus not literal, not concrete literal, is if in the Old Testament it wasn't concrete literal, do you think that we should interpret it in the Revelation as concrete literal? That's just one of those, I think that that's a good tool. I think that that's, that's a good, good starting place. We look into the Old Testament, and, and we'll be throughout the Old Testament here just in chapter 1. And we look at, at the language of the Old Testament, and we look at the way symbols are being used there, and we ask, was it symbolic or was it literal? And then when we get to the book of the Revelation, and we see the same thing, we should ask, since it wasn't, or it was literal, should it be literal here or not? Now, I already brought up that I think... Oh, there it is. There's, there's Kiliasm. Now, I, I brought up to you, you... You see the the triangle on that front page. And I brought up to you that I believe the book of the, the Revelation is a, is a Kiliasm. And I believe that there are hints in the cycles to remind you of the previous cycle. You see here in verses uh, chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 3, things which must soon take place for the, 
for the time is near. You get to the end of the book, you get to chapter 22, and you see in verse 6, things which must soon take place. Verse 10, for the time is near. I think that John is intentionally using language to remind you of something he's already said. And if I'm right, then I think that we are to read the book as a uh, chiliasm. Uh, going back to my, my understanding that verse 3 is verse three is the key to understanding the entire book. Uh, verse 3 talks about he who reads, he who hears. John is indicating that his immediate audience, the seven churches that are in Asia Minor in the first century, they would be blessed to read and hear. That tells me that the book of the Revelation is not simply future, but is also present. So it's a little bit of both. There's got to be elements that the first century church would need to know some of these things, would, would need to have purpose for this. But as, as you were pointing out, a lot of this text, it doesn't make sense that it's in the past. And so my opinion is parts of the text are in the past and parts of the text are in the future. And that raises the big question, which parts? Uh, verses 4 through 6. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the uh, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth to him who loved us and released us from our sins by his blood and he has made us to be a kingdom priests to his God and father to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever amen uh, John begins his letter very very New Testament epistolary right uh, greetings uh, grace and peace sounds a little bit like Paul there, doesn't it? Uh, to the seven churches. Seven, fullness, completeness, perfection. There were seven days of creation. There were seven days in the unleavened bread. Uh, seven sprinklings uh, to purify. Uh, seven days for cleaning, etc., etc. I don't think, and by the way, we are going to run into the number seven many, 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 many times as we read through this text. I don't think it's an accident. I think it's there intentionally. And he begins with many, many, many Old Testament references, uh, re referring to God as him who is, who was, and who is to come. Perhaps this brings to our mind uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. There God identifies himself as I am. You are to say, I am has sent you. I am that I am. So that threefold I am, I am, I am. Uh, possibly Isaiah chapter 43 verse 10 there God says that I am God before me there was no God after me there will be no God so that threefold uh, introduction to God the Father is picked up right here the seven spirits now interestingly Zechariah chapter 4 mentions seven mentions the spirit of God as seven lamps now, if you've already read the text, you know that lamps are going to come come up here very quickly, uh, aren't they? Now, I already, I already mentioned this in, in, in our last section. If God the Father has already been mentioned and God the Son is, is about to be mentioned, it only makes sense that this, this seven spirits here is the Holy Spirit, right? Father, Spirit, Son in this order, right? Um, <clears throat> now... Uh, is the, seven, is the Holy Spirit seven spirits? No, seven is a symbol. And I really believe that the book is getting us going. The book is already confronting us on page one with symbols. The book is already telling you, you're going to have to dig beyond the surface. You're going to have to scratch away at the text and ask good questions if you're going to, if, if you're going to, if you're going to understand this text. He goes on to talk about Jesus. Uh, 
And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn, he's quoting Psalm 89. He's quoting verses 37 and 27. He's making reference to the faithful witness, to the firstborn. In the context of the psalm, the person being the firstborn there means that he is the king of all the kings. Now here in Revelation, he goes on to to call him the ruler of the kings of the earth. Uh, He also brings up he also brings up the fact that this uh, Jesus was uh, the firstborn from amongst the dead. So he's bringing up the resurrection and he's bringing up God's power in the resurrection, which would would correct us from from ever thinking that this is the first created thing of God. Being the firstborn in this case is not the first created thing, but it's being born in the power of God. And uh, here's your first typo that I found in your notes. You're going to change from praise to praise. If you look at your notes, I've got the wrong praise there in your notes. I found this too late. I had already print, printed the notes. Uh, this uh, makes John, as he's describing Jesus, it makes him break out into praise of Jesus. He has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. This is very much Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, where uh, Moses wrote, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Uh, These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. Now here in our text, here in our uh, New Testament, here in the book of the Revelation, What Israel was to be, the church has been made. You'll notice that the past tense is is being brought up here. Um, And he has made us to be uh, a kingdom and priest to his God most high. And you'll remember that the Old Testament prophets were always calling Israel back to the covenant, always calling them back to what they were supposed to be and never, never accomplished. Now that's not... For us to stand here and look back at them with pride. You were supposed to be something and you never made it. That should be a reminder to us that we are a kingdom and priests to God. And that should be something that we should take notice of. Every day as we live, we are a kingdom and we are priests to God most high. Uh, Starting in 7... And yeah, just just uh, verse seven. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him and all of the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. Once again, da- uh, excuse me. Once again, John is quoting the Old Testament. He's quoting Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. He's quoting Zechariah chapter 12, verses 10 through 14. Now, uh, he's saying that he is coming with the clouds. And this brings to our mind the Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7, coming on the clouds to the Ancient of Days. And there in, in Daniel chapter 7, when he comes on the clouds to the Ancient of Days, he's given all dominion, he's given all authority. Now Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24 verse 30, says that the Son of Man is coming in, in judgment... And verse 34, and this generation will not pass away. This is one of the, the, those, those hard texts of the New Testament because we read Matthew chapter 24, chapter 25, and there are events that Jesus is prophesying that seem to fit very well with the first century, seem to fit very well with the judgment on Jerusalem. But there are other parts of that that don't seem to fit with something in the past. They seem to be ta- talking about something in the future. Now, you'll remember that Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24 is Jesus' answer to what the disciples ask him. Uh, Verse 3, the disciples come to him. So this is Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. The disciples come and they ask him, when will these things happen? Previous to this, Jesus has just been walking in the temples. One of the disciples pointed out the buildings and said, look at these, these amazing buildings. And Jesus says, do you see these? 
One day will come when not one stone will be left upon another. And they go over to the Mount of Olives. And then the disciples come to him and they ask him two questions. They ask him, when will these things happen? So in other words, when will this day that not one stone is going to be left upon another happen? And then they ask, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now that's interesting that the disciples just put his coming and the end of the age at the same time. And as you read throughout Jesus' answer, he never clearly delineates the two. He never tries to tell the disciples, you got it wrong, you're putting these two events together. Instead, he does seem to have these two events together, the coming of the Son of Man and the end of the age being the same event. Matthew chapter 26, verse 46, Jesus is before the high priest Caiaphas, and Jesus says to Caiaphas that you are going to see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. So isn't this interesting that we've got these texts in, in the previous uh, or two chapters earlier where judgment is coming and the Son of Man is going to be coming on the clouds. Here he's talking to a person that's alive and breathing in the first century and he's saying to him, you are going to see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. Did Jesus come back in the first century? Is he wrong? When he says that this is going to happen in this generation, and when he says to Caiaphas, you are going to see the Son of Man coming on the clouds, we've got some sort of tension here, don't we? We, we, we need Jesus to be right. Some prophecies have multiple layers of fulfillment. When I was a kid, we went to Yellowstone and we went into one of the buildings and they showed us a 3D movie of Yellowstone. And I was a little kid and I put the glasses on and the movie was in 3D. Now, a couple of years back, I went to a 3D movie and I forgot to bring these glasses. So I put the 3D glasses on and I was really disappointed in this 3D movie because I remembered as a seven-year-old seeing this great three-dimensional movie and I wondered if I would have worn my glasses are those are those special glasses are they are they do they only work if you if you have 2020 vision and once you have your glasses on are are you back to to 2020 vision and is that what's going on Isaiah chapter 7 Isaiah chapter 7 has that that verse about the virgin will be with child and you'll remember that in its context, in Isaiah's context, that virgin being with child was assigned to wicked King Ahab. Correct the spelling in your notes. I put the wrong, I put wicked, not wicked. My bad. But Matthew, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, picks that up as a sign of Mary being with the virgin. Uh, being the virgin with the child. And that not being assigned just to King Ahaz, but being assigned to the Jewish people of the first century. So kind of the way that movie jumps off the screen at you and you see this first level somewhere close to you, but you see something a little bit further back and you still see something a little bit further back than that. I think the prophecy works that way. I think the biblical prophecy works that way that there's one kind of fulfillment and then there's another kind of fulfillment and there's possibly even still another kind of fulfillment left to left to come with that Jesus coming on the clouds 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 17 Jesus second coming he said to be coming on the clouds I think that this verse here in Revelation chapter 1 verse 7, I think it's to remind us of Jesus, the Son of Man, coming into the Ancient of Days, which has already happened, where he received dominion, where he received authority. I think that it's to remind us of Jesus' coming in judgment against Israel in the first century when those words of Jesus were fulfilled. The temple was destroyed. The buildings were knocked down. All of this was a, judge, was a judgment. And I think that this is still to come. Jesus coming again because every eye will see him. A future event. Something that we will see. 
So did, am I communicating here that I think there's multiple levels to this? And it's to remind us of when Jesus received all power and authority before the Ancient of Days. It's to remind us of Jesus' coming in judgment on the nation of Israel. And it's to tell us about Jesus' coming in the future. Does that make any sense? Or have I lost everybody on this one? I'm sorry, what? I wasn't good at three-dimensional chess. <laughs> uh. Every eye will see him. Now here too, I think there's more than one level. I think there's more than one layer of fulfillment in this. I think that there's the first present reality. Jesus has been present in the ancient church and he's been present throughout the church and he's present in the church today. But he's not present in a physical way, right? When we come here and we gather, is Jesus with us? But is Jesus with us physically? No. Now, there will be a day that Jesus will physically come back, right? And so I think that there's multiple layers even to this. Those who pierced him, every tribe will mourn over him, literally... I think they saw this. I think rebellious Israel, who used Rome to literally pierce him, they saw Jesus coming in judgment. And I think that there's a symbolic thing going on here too, and that is that I pierced him. You pierced him. When we put him on the cross because of our sins, and when we see him, it's because we are the ones that pierced him. So I don't think there's one level to this text. I think there's multiple levels to this text. I think there's some fulfillment in the past. I think there's obviously fulfillment still to come. Verse 8. Verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. How many of you have a red letter Bible? Anybody have a red letter Bible? Is this uh, is this in red or is it not in red? You, you, yours is not in red. Yours is 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 in red. Uh, Alpha and Omega in the Greek it, it would be the equivalent of A and Z. And as, as you look up there, it looks a little bit like A and W. Does anybody have lunch plans? <laughs> Uh, the, the, the person speaking here is the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is still to come, the Almighty. Here in a couple of verses, we're going to have Jesus speaking, and there, there's going to be no question that it's Jesus speaking. Jesus is going to identify himself as the first and the last. That's kind of like the Alpha and the Omega, only it's also kind of different, isn't it? Because it is the same, but it's different. Which is a little bit of the mystery of the Trinity, huh? Where, where God the Father is God, God the Son is God. And the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. But they're both God. So I think that once again, we're getting a little bit of mystery going on here. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of mystery. Only a little bit, though. Okay, verses 9 through 16. Big chunk here, okay? I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the isle called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying... Write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. And we're going through verse 16. Okay. Uh, Verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. 
And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe that reached to his feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were as white, were white like white wool, uh, like snow, and his eyes were like a, like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze once they have been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. Wow. Right? How many of you remember a couple years ago there was an eclipse? Now, where we lived in Idaho, we were almost in the path of totality. Now, the path of totality was this, was this narrow band that stretched across the U.S. And once the moon completely covered the sun at that point, they said it was safe to take off your special glasses. Now, I never did because we weren't in the path of totality. We were about 30 miles south of the path of totality, okay? The sun's kind of bright, isn't it? Kind of shines up there in the sky. And if you look at it, you kind of got to look away really quickly, right? And if you don't, you could actually do damage to your, to your eyes if you, if you look at the sun too long, right? Now, here's, here's, here's my take, and I'm agreeing with uh, N.T. Wright on this. Have, have any of you ever obsessed over something? Have any of you ever continually went back to something over and over and over, and that night when you went to bed, your dreams were that thing that you're obsessed about? You're, you're, you're playing it out again in your head, you're having a conversation over and over and over and so forth. May I share with you my dream last night? Actually, my dream last night was somehow we were further in the book of the Revelation and I wasn't prepared to, for, for those chapters. And so I'm standing up here trying to tell you about stuff and I'm like, I don't remember what I thought about that because my notes are not for this. So, so obviously that's what I was thinking of before I went to bed. You know what? And, and, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, trying to make fun of John or I'm not trying to, 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 to uh, put this down or anything. But my thought is that John has spent his whole life reading his Old Testament. He's spent his whole life going to synagogue and hearing Daniel and hearing Zechariah and hearing Isaiah and hearing the Psalms and hearing these things. And he's read them when he's had the chance. And now he's on the Isle of Patmos. And the reason that God is able to use this vision and able to use him in such a way is his brain is just soaked in Old Testament scripture. His brain is just soaked in all this Old Testament imagery. And so when he sees things, he's able to go, you know what, that looks a lot like Daniel said, or that looks a lot like what Zechariah said, or that looks a lot like what Isaiah said. Interesting. John, brother, fellow partaker in the tribulation, kingdom, and perseverance that are in Jesus. Now, kingdom is easy to get, right? The idea of Jesus coming in a kingdom and him being the king and we being subject to him in the kingdom. That's easy to get, right? Tribulation. That doesn't sound good. That sounds bad. That doesn't sound like something I want, you know. Do you want tribulation? And yet John is saying that tribulation is part of this package deal. Also perseverance. Perseverance is keeping going. Perseverance is not stopping. How many of you have ever made a New Year's resolution? How many of you are still carrying out that New Year's resolution? How many of you have stopped carrying out that New Year's resolution? John has seen that in Jesus, it's not just kingdom. There's also tribulation. There's also the call for perseverance. And I think that this was important to them. And I think that it's important to us. He's in the Spirit. This is very much like Ezekiel chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 18. And this really shouldn't surprise us 
Because I told you that um, I think the text indicates that this book is supposed to stand in line with Daniel. It's supposed to stand in line with Ezekiel. It's supposed to stand in line with these things. And so the idea that Ezekiel describes himself as being in the Spirit, the idea that John describes himself as being in the Spirit, it just seems to flow naturally. The Lord's Day... This is the only time in the entire New Testament that we find this. It's not identical with the day of Yahweh or, or the day of the Lord. This is simply the Lord's day. Um, John doesn't elaborate on it further. Acts chapter 20, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 says that Christians meet on the first day of the week. So I'm of the opinion that it's Sunday. I'm of the opinion that the day John is sitting here doing this, he's in the Spirit, I'm of the opinion it's Sunday. And John is commissioned to write. It's identical to Isaiah chapter 30, Jeremiah chapter 30. The Old Testament prophets were told, write this down. Verse 12, lampstands and this awesome figure, one like a son of man. This should bring to our mind, of course, Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. Um, what did Daniel see? What did Daniel see in that Son of Man in, in Daniel chapter 7 and so forth? He saw a vision. He saw symbols. He saw godless nations oppressing God's people. Jesus is described as having a robe and a sash. That sounds a lot like the Old Testament priest, doesn't it? Daniel chapter 10. This is this is this this time that Daniel, he's, he's by a river. His friends don't see this vision, but he sees this vision. And this is a message to God's people. But the person in Daniel 10 is not the son of man. It's an angel. He even identifies himself as an angel. But the description in uh, Daniel chapter 10 and the description here in, John, uh, here in Revelation are so similar that it can't be coincidence. John wants you to think of Daniel chapter 10 as he's describing his encounter here. But this guy that he's seeing, he has white hair. The guy in the angel in, in Daniel 7, he doesn't have white hair. And this, Dan, excuse me, Daniel 10, the guy in Daniel 10 doesn't have white hair. But the guy John is seeing, he has white hair. And that brings to our mind Daniel chapter 7. The Ancient of Days is described as having white hair. And a sword comes out of his mouth. Isaiah chapter uh, 49 verse 2. All this Old Testament imagery coming together in this one person. And John's reaction to, John's reaction to him is very similar to Daniel's reaction back there in Daniel chapter 10. We're going to finish the chapter uh, verses 17 through 20. When I saw him... I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first, and I am the last. I am the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever. And I have the keys to death and Hades. Therefore, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Once again, wow, a lot going on here in just these, these few verses. Um, Jesus identifies himself. He identifies himself as the first and the last. It's very similar to the Alpha and the Omega. But Jesus identifies himself as the living one who was dead and came back. So he, he is saying that I'm kind of like the one who was mentioned previously, the Alpha and the Omega, in the same way. I'm the first and I'm the last. But I was dead and I came back. He who was and is and will be, he never died. And Jesus has the keys to death and Hades, Hades being the place of the dead. Now, I think that Jesus saying this here at the beginning of the book is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly important. You want to know why? Because the enemy of all mankind throughout all of history has been death, hasn't it? 
The enemy of all mankind has been death. And one of the things that has happened throughout not just church history, but going into Jewish history, is people dying for their faith. Going back to the Maccabees, going back prior to that, people dying for their faith. And what John is about to do is he's going to write letters to churches where people will literally die for their faith. Now, in parts of the world today, people literally die for their faith. Where we're living, we're pretty, we're pretty safe. It's not that there hasn't been any American martyrs killed in churches for worshiping Jesus. It's just that it's not that common overall, right? Now, is that a scary thing? Is it a scary thing to die? Well, it's one of the greatest fears of mankind, right up there with public speaking and going to the dentist. Personally, going to the dentist is highest on my list, just, just in case you ever wanted to know. And Jesus is saying, that thing that you fear, I've got the keys to it. And the place of the dead, I've got the keys to it too. Meaning, if Jesus has the keys to it, he can get you out of it. Now, that doesn't mean he can get you out of dying, but the results of that, he can get you out of it. So don't be afraid. Mystery. The Greek word here is hidden things, it's secret things. And remember that this whole book is about revealing the secret things. Lampstands equal churches, stars equal angels of the churches. This is just my opinion. I know it's a popular interpretation that the angels of these churches are the pastors or the overseers that were in these ancient churches. I don't think that's it. I think that these churches worship the Lamb. And I think as we get into the heavenly scenes in the book of the Revelation, I see angels worshiping the Lamb. I see earth and heaven getting really, really, really close in this book. I see earth and heaven not being this great gap because Jesus is pulling up the veil and Jesus is showing you that it's not that far apart. Now, it's, it's not touching. You, you remember being in the back seat of the car with your siblings. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. Or you remember your kids playing that game, right? Right? And I think that that's a huge message here in the book of the Revelation. We think of the heavens as somewhere way out there. And God is somewhere way out there. But the whole message of the book is Jesus isn't that far away. And heaven, uh, not, not, not to quote uh, either foreigner or winger, I forget which one, heaven isn't too far away. Nobody? It's either foreigner or it's winger, I forget now. Um, once again, seven. Once again, seven being here in our thing. Uh, the things... Things that are not things are not as they appear. Remember Daniel chapter two. He reveals secret things. He has made them known. The things which will take place. Jesus is the Son of Man. I think that that's a very important thing for us to start this book understanding that Jesus is Daniel's Son of Man. He does have the rule and he does have the authority. He is in the middle of his churches. Remember that it just said that John sees the seven lampstands. Where's Jesus? He's in the middle of the seven churches. As the churches go through persecution, remember we already talked about, is Jesus here? Yes, but is he here physically? No. If the church is facing persecution, if the church is facing hard times, and Jesus isn't with us physically. Is it sometimes easy to forget that he's with us spiritually? Is it sometimes easy to think that Jesus is just up in heaven, uh, sitting by the swimming pool, drinking margaritas, and we're down here on earth suffering? Jesus is saying, I'm in the middle of the churches, in the present, in the future, and at the end. With that, I'm going to open the floor for questions.